Good evening. I'm Kevin Kretschmer, an adult programming librarian at the Franklin Avenue Library. Thank you for linking to tonight's program, Baked into the Cake, with Dr. Kevin Gannon. Before I turn the program over to our speaker, I want to make you aware of a few procedural items. First, the mics of all patrons are automatically muted for this program. Second, if you have a question for Dr. Gannon, please use the Q&A feature to send it to us during the program. When Dr. Gann Gannon concludes his presentation, there will be a short Q&A session during which your question may be asked. And finally, if you have, are having trouble technically with any aspect of the feed, please use the chat feature to receive assistance from one of our librarians. The library is pleased to welcome back Dr. Kevin Gannon, the Director of the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning and a Professor of History at Grandview University, where he's taught since 2004. Some of you will recognize Dr. Gannon from his in-person appearances at the Franklin Avenue Library for the series Becoming American in 2019, or as a presenter of Understanding White Privilege earlier this year. A former program coordinator, new student seminar, and department chair, his current role is a blend of administrative and faculty responsibilities. His teaching, research, and public work, including writing, centers on critical and inclusive pedagogy, race, history, and justice, as well as technology and teaching. He's a speaker and consultant on a range of topics on campuses across North America. In this work, he endeavors to bring passion, humor, and interactivity to his audiences. Looking for more? Find him on Twitter, at the Tattooed Prof. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kevin Gannon. Good evening, and thank you, Kevin, for that introduction. Uh, much appreciated and very kind uh, for the library to invite me back <laughs> and uh, let me hang out with everybody again for this evening. And to all the attendees out there, uh, thank you very much for choosing to spend a little bit of your time with us and with uh, Des Moines Public Libraries this evening. Uh, so I'm going to do that awkward transition into the Zoom screen share. So if you'll bear with me for just a second here. There. Okay. And so next to a box with my disembodied head on it, you probably see a title slide with the title for this evening's presentation on it. And so that's what I want to have a few remarks on uh, this evening is the way that race and policy in the United States have braided together, have intertwined together to the point where, you know, if you want to use the colloquialism, we can talk about these things being baked into the cake. Uh, another way to look at it might be through the lens of the famous story by David Foster Wallace, the late novelist, uh, This is Water. And as Foster tells it, there's two young fish swimming along in the ocean and an older fish comes alongside them and says, morning boys, how's the water? And the two young fish, one looks to the other and says, what the hell is water? And that's, I think, sometimes when we think about race and the way that race works in American society, in the United States, whether it's through our history or in our present moment, that in many cases, especially for those of us who identify or are identified as white, it's a lot like a fish trying to explain water. We are in it, it is all around us, it suffuses everything we do, it is an omnipresent thing whether we realize it or not. And since we spend so much time immersed in these structures in our society that have been shaped by race, racism, and the inequalities that spring from it, it can be hard for us to describe because it has become part of that landscape. But if we take a longer view and we look back in American history, even to the very first days of the founding of the United States as an independent nation, we can see that race and in particular racism has worked to define the answers to the essential questions that the framers of the founding documents of this country, the Declaration of Independence is pictured here, and the Constitution were obsessed with. What does it mean to be an American? And this, was, this question was opened, uh, but certainly not resolved uh, when we see the framing of the Declaration of Independence, the victory in the Revolutionary War, and the ratification of the US Constitution. What does, it mean to be an, what does it mean to be an American is still a question that we debate today, as a matter of fact. But more importantly, we debate its corollary as well, because we have never satisfactorily resolved the issue of who gets to answer that question and who gets to decide for other groups. And this was a trend, again, that was baked into the cake from the beginning, 
because as the principal author of the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson, the tall redheaded guy in the middle of this picture here, uh, serves as an example of, there were many people living in what became the independent United States who were certainly not seen as American. The some 200 African and African Americans whom Jefferson claimed ownership of as enslaved human beings, uh, but thousands, tens of thousands of enslaved black people throughout the United States or the new incipient United States as well. In addition to the enslaved minority in this country, the Declaration of Independence and the conception of American nationhood also did not include the original Americans, the indigenous inhabitants of the Americas who were in the process of being displaced either by treaty, by violence, or most often both by people of Jefferson's ilk. And so race has always been with us in the United States because race has always been looming over and suffusing through that very question who gets to be an American? And as the sociologist Michael Omi and Howard would not put it in a classic text called Racial Formation in the United States, we have always been a race conscious society in this country. Uh, there are many who try even from a place of, of, of good intent to say, I don't see color, uh, that I am colorblind, that it is the individual that matters, not the group. But as an aggregate, as a society, as a historical entity, the United States has never been colorblind. And as, as Omi and Wanat put it, from the very inception of the Republic until our present moment, race, and by race we mean this categorization of human beings based primarily upon the color of one's skin. Race has been a profound determinant of one's political rights, one's location in the labor market, and indeed one sense of identity. And so we need to really sit with this idea of race and think about the ways that it has worked in American society in order to understand the multi-varied, uh, the, the multi-faceted uh, nature of our current moment. So where does this concept of race come from? In other words, why is it that we live in a society and we're not alone in this, but we do have our own particular emphases on it, that assigns categories that we call race as if they were carved in stone, unchanging, perpetual places where people are sorted into, and the way that they are sorted into those places comes from their complexion. And of course, when we think about that, it starts to break down pretty quickly, right? How many black people are literally black? How many people that we call white are literally white, right? We use these color label shorthands to mask a much more complicated social, cultural, and political reality. But this idea of sorting people, of categorizing people, has been with human society since the classical era. And so Aristotle, for example, in his uh, essays on that are collected in a volume that we know as The Politics, Aristotle talks about humanity being divided into two different camps, the masters and the slaves. Some people are born into one, other people are born into the other. For Aristotle, these categories transposed or synonymous were with Greeks and barbarians. The Greeks were the masters, the barbarians fit for slavery, the Greeks had the right to command, the barbarians, the enslaved, were born to obey. And so part of this intellectual tradition that, that is a wellspring for future European and eventually Western and North American societies as well, is built on this idea that there are ins and there are outs. There is us and there is them. There's me and there's everybody else, right? And what values appertain to those different categories? Who gets to be American and who gets to answer the question? Aristotle was thinking about very similar things, except his questions were, who gets to be Greek? And I get to answer that question. One of the key features of what we call the Enlightenment's intellectual culture, this period in the 1600s, 1700s, this great intellectual and political efflorescence, uh, where we see everything from the effects of the scientific revolution, you know, Isaac Newton and his, uh, his um, experiments not only 
establishing laws of physical motion, but creating calculus as a language to describe these phenomena. John Locke, the political thinker who was so influential on American founding fathers like Thomas Jefferson, for example. If you ever took Philosophy 101 or have read an introductory textbook on cultural and intellectual thought, names like Kant, for example, Immanuel Kant, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, one of the theorists of the French Revolution, uh, Voltaire, these were all enlightenment figures, this intellectual and cultural and even political movement that profoundly shaped the world in which the founders of the United States were moving. And one of the key features of this intellectual culture of the enlightenment was this sort of scientific empirical reasoning impulse. We have all this input, enlightenment thinkers argue. We have this data, we have these observations that we've made. Some animals act like this, other animals act like that. So let's invent a system to classify those animals. And this is where you get Carl Linnaeus and his uh, kingdom, phylum, genus, order, all those, the way that we classify the animal kingdom today, right? So enlightenment political culture was meant to, to rationalize, to bring order to our observations of society, of things around us and people. And so it makes sense that as enlightenment thinkers are categorizing the animal kingdom and various orders of plants and then, you know, the flora and fauna of the world, that they're also characterizing other forms of input that's taken in by the human senses. So Robert Boyle, who's known as one of the founding fathers of the discipline of chemistry, uh, an English scientist and a member of the Royal Academy of Sciences, Robert Boyle did a lot of experiments of refracting light you know, prism experiments where, or prism, excuse me, not prison, uh, where beams of light would be refracted through a prism and broken into their component colors, uh, sort of like the album cover to Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon, if you have a picture of that in your head. And what Boyle wanted to do was to see what the components were of the light that suffuses our world. Uh, and because that light was literally what surrounded all of us. And Boyle believed that that was important in terms of the way that human beings experienced and perceived their world. And so Boyle analyzed the colors, the, the primary colors that he was able to isolate with these uh, spectrum experiments. And white in this color, the combination of all of them was, according to physics, you know, so don't blame him, it's just science, right? According to physics, white was the chiefest color. It was what happened when all of the individual components of light merged together to form what illuminates the world. But of course, the opposite of that, Boyle goes on to say, blackness, the absence of color. This is the ugly deviation, the deficiency, the abnormal. And what Boyle is reflecting in his scientific language here was the larger cultural impulse, particularly in Western Europe, that defined white chiefly in terms of its opposite that is black and so it's one thing to say this is what it's like when you look at light or the absence thereof right but what if you're a social philosopher and you're analyzing you know the chiefest color or you know the sort of the top of the ladder the top of the hierarchy the most desirable product and then it's the opposite so if blackness in other words was the corruption of whiteness you know, even in the physical world, as Boyle termed it, if blackness was the deviation that helped us identify the norm, then what else would blackness become for Europeans? And it's no coincidence that at this same time of this efflorescence of, of scientific revolution and enlightenment thought, that we see the crescendoing of the slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade, whereby over 11 million Africans were forcibly taken from their homes and sent across the Atlantic to various destinations in the Caribbean and North and South America. And so the way that black was seen by those who considered themselves white, these categories are evolving in the same era that we see the founding of the United States. And so one might say, well, it's kind of a stretch to go from Boyle's light experiments into a cultural view of black people. Uh, but those connections were being made. So here's Immanuel Kant, who is basically the founding father of Western philosophy. Uh, and in his book, Conversations or Observations, excuse me, on the feelings of the beautiful and the sublime, where Kant is laying out a philosophical framework for aesthetic judgments, uh, 
Kant is using as his examples here, the opposite of the beautiful, the opposite of the sublime, right? And so here is a person who has an enormous intellectual reach platform and power who has, so far as we know, never had any personal interactions with Africans themselves, laying down judgment about what he calls the fundamental differences between these two types of men. And so notice what Kant is doing here. He's taking an aesthetic judgment, the comparison of light complected and dark complected people. And he is reading actual mental, cognitive, biological sounding realities into that aesthetic judgment, right? You know, the difference appears to be as great in terms of mental capacity as it does skin complexion. This is how they behave because of this complexion, this determinism, in other words, that people who look one way behave in a certain way as well. There was not any empirical evidence that grounded this systematically. One of the important things to realize about this early discourse that creates this European defined idea of blackness that becomes the basis for our modern conceptions of race and racisms and, and white supremacist actions is that these are aesthetic judgments, very subjective in their origin, but being framed as if they were universal scientific truths. So this is racism garbed in the cloak of scientific language, and it achieves legitimacy in European culture and eventually American culture through that language being its vehicle. So if you've ever wondered why white people are called Caucasians, here's your answer. Because picking up on some of the methods and observations of people like Boyle uh, and, and Kant was perhaps the foremost enlightenment thinker and theorist of human difference or race, Johann Friedrich Blumenbach. Uh, who wrote a book that was a bestseller for the time. Thomas Jefferson had a copy in his library, for example, called On the Natural Variety of Mankind. And what Blumenbach's goal was to do was to do what naturalists were doing for the animal and plant kingdoms, was to take a look at human societies and classify them. What traits belong where? And so what Blumenbach argued through mostly the examination of skulls, that was his thing, the shape of skulls, measured cranial capacity, slope of jaw, nasal cavity, uh, depth or, or, or protrusion of the eyebrow ridge, features like that, which we know now don't really break down along as neatly as Blumenbach uh, posited that they did. But according to Blumenbach, and you see this illustration from his book on the, on the natural variety of mankind here at the bottom of the, of the page, there were five varieties of man, as he called it, human beings. And, it, and they occupied places on a ladder, you know, higher up on a scale that today we might refer to as evolutionary. And at the very top of the ladder, surprise, coincidence, were people who looked like Blumenbach. So Blumenbach called whites, Europeans, he called them Caucasians, because he traced the origin of this particular skull shape to what's now the Republic of Georgia in the Caucasus region of East Central Europe. And so this variety of people are from around Mount Caucasus produces, as Blumenbach said, the most beautiful race of men. And this picture in the bottom right, this is Blumenbach, and note by his left arm there is the skull to which he's referring to in this quote. He kept the skull of a young Georgian woman because visitors thought it was cool and he thought it was attractive. And what he believed was it was the perfect archetype of the kind of racial form of the Caucasian variety. And it's through this lens, through people like Blumenbach, that others, including people who framed the United States and its political system, who claimed ownership of enslaved human beings, who were moving in a world where people looked different than them, this was the set of lenses that they now began to use. And that set of lenses, that set of categories, the idea that there are different types of our species, that you could break it down by physical characteristics, that there is somehow a boundary between Indian and Caucasian, and as Blumenbach called it, the Negroid or African. This idea has stayed with us 
but it rests again. And I want you to see this, this quote here on an aesthetic judgment. Blumenbach characterized things by which skull shape he thought was most attractive, most symmetrical in his proportions. And we have been living with the products of these types of aesthetic judgments from a very narrow subset of white Europe, Western European thinkers who argue, surprise, that white Western Europeans sit at the top of the ladder. And their rhetoric and their methods of deducing this out depend on this idea that there is science behind it, that this is, by using deductive reasoning, empirical evidence, and physical observation, the way the world is. But mostly what it represents is this larger human impulse that we use when we identify not just ourselves, but when we see ourselves in relation to others as members of a community, right? Because many of our conceptual understandings, when we talk about what we are, right, the, the, the essence of our identity, most of those understandings depend upon their opposite in order to make sense. Right. So if I say I am tall, that doesn't make any sense unless you know what short means. Right. Tall and short depend upon one another. To find their meaning. So I am tall because I am not short. I am male because I am not female. I am white because I am not black. I am Christian because I am not heathen. Right. Think of all of the dichotomies that white Europeans are bringing to the fore as they encounter people who look differently than them. And so it's one thing for us to say, I am X because I am not Y, right? That's how we order the visual input that we get all the time, right? To, to make sense of our surroundings. But it's not very many steps from making an observation. This person has a darker complexion than I do. That's empirical evidence. But when we say this person has a darker complexion than I do, and therefore this person has certain qualities, and I have certain qualities that are superior to that person by virtue of my complexion. It doesn't take too many steps to get to that place. And that's where racism and the idea of white supremacy has evolved from, from thinkers who are making exactly that type of argument based upon physical differences that they asserted were eternal and unchanging. But we know now through advances in biology and in particular the study of human DNA and the chromosomal and genetic structures that we share as human beings, that there is no genetic basis for the categories that we call race. In other words, you could look at a human chromosome, and if you've ever heard of the Human Genome Project, right, the mapping out of the, the genetic structure of human beings. So you can look at somebody's genetic blueprint and you cannot see anything in there that would tell you with certainty that that person is African-American or Asian slash Pacific Islander or Hispanic, which is a category that doesn't even show up until 1973, by the way. So there is no genetic basis for dividing people into these categories. And in fact, what some of the recent genetic work on this idea of race has shown us is that for those of us who identify as white, and I'm using the picture I've got here, so me and then Kevin Kretschmer here, we would be deemed white males. And if there's someone out there in Zoom land who is African-American, I am actually more likely to have more in common with you, African-American person, genetically, than I am the other Kevin here. In other words, there's more likelihood of having commonalities across what we would term as racial differences in our genetic structure, in our, in our DNA blueprint. There is no genetic basis for the categories that we see as race. They are not fixed. They are not carved in stone. They are not products of biology. They are products of history. They are products of culture. They are products of the way that human beings seek to categorize themselves and others around them. Race, as we see it today, is solely determined by visual interpretation of someone's phenotype. That is the amount of melanin that is in their complexion. And so people are deemed black or brown or white 
and if you go anachronistic into the 18 and 1900s, the red and the yellow races, et cetera, it was a visual judgment based upon someone's observation about a phenotype. But think about this, for example, those things are not immutable. If I go down to South Padre Island next spring, assuming COVID is over and we can ever travel again, if I go down to South Padre Island and get a bitch and tan for spring break and that makes me brown, am I Hispanic? Because that's the way we sort things, right? You know, I have a lot of tattoos. What do you do with my skin color there, right? So the way that we categorize race has always rested on a very flimsy basis. And that's even before you get into people who classify as multiracial, right? So when people say Barack Obama was the first black president of the United States, well, Obama had a white parrot and a black parrot. 50% if you want to play the genetic odds there, right? So why is he black and not white? Like why, if, if, if both things are equal, why is Obama not called a white president? Why does the blackness become what weighs more in the balance? It's because of our cultural predilections to look at race as a matter of complexion. And again, what's the biological basis for that? Out of the over 25,000 gene combinations, uh, gene pairings that occur in the human chromosome, somewhere around 40 to, you know, maybe 100 are involved in determining one's skin pigmentation. By way of comparison, about 10 times that amount go into defining how tall someone will eventually grow to be over the span of their life. So how come we don't divide people by height into racial categories, right? Why don't we use any or outy belly buttons? Why don't we use whether your earlobe is attached or dangling? We use skin color instead mostly because it's obvious and human nature is kind of lazy. We want to take snap judgments about the easiest form of input that we have and make categorizations. But we need to be aware that those judgments we are making and those classifications that we are making do not rest in the actual realities of science. So let's say you turn on the evening news and the weather forecast comes in. And the weather forecaster stands up in front of the camera and says, in order to give the forecast for the next seven days, I am going to take this live goat that he then pulls into the camera range and sacrifice it. And I will read its entrails live here on television to be able to divine what the next week's weather will be, plus whether or not we'll have a good harvest. We would probably not trust that television meteorologist. We would certainly hope that we weren't watching during dinner time, right? We don't, you know, even though that is the way that ancient Mesopotamians did their weather forecasting, we have learned things since the dawn of Sumerian civilization that have helped us do a little bit better about forecasting the weather as opposed to reading the guts of a goat. We don't practice witchcraft. I don't bring somebody into a university environment to teach a chemistry lab whose first lesson is going to be, I will teach my students how to transmogrify lead into gold. We're not going to hire somebody at Grandview to teach our introduction to physical geography class whose first week on the syllabus is why the earth is flat, right? We know better. Science has told us better. So we don't do weather forecasting by reading the entrails of goats. In fact, you would laugh that weatherman out of the studio if that was the proposition that they brought before you, right? Yet we cling to this idea of race, which has just as much basis in the science. So we practice witchcraft, maybe not, but do we practice racecraft? You bet, racecraft. In other words, we're using this set of ideas to order our existence, to determine in some cases who is human and who is not, who gets power and who doesn't, who matters and who doesn't. And we're using a set of categories that are not based in science. It is the equivalent of witchcraft. And the damage that that has done, not just in the United States as our kind of focus is here tonight, but worldwide has been well nigh immeasurable. So we start to associate, if we have this scientific discourse about how darker people are now different and inferior and the other, we start to get medical science in the 19th century. The cutting edge medical science was from Samuel Cartwright. Uh, a physician who lived, he's originally from Alabama, a slaveholding state before the Civil War. And what Cartwright's research specialty was, 
was the physiognomy, as he called it, of the Negro. And what Cartwright was really after was trying to justify how one could make the case that slavery, the enslavement of human beings, was actually beneficial, not just to the white slave owner, but to the enslaved person themselves. And what Cartwright argued, again, notice the cloaking in language of science here. If you let the Negro, as he termed it, be free, then they would die. That was his argument. Disease, he said, is the natural offspring of Negro liberty, because given that liberty, that freedom, all they would do was be idle, wallow in filth, and indulge in improper food and drink. According to Cartwright, who was, again, one of the leading practitioners of medicine and medical science, he is published throughout the United States. This is what race is. He writes a longer article on it in 1851 that's published in DuBose Review, which was probably one of the top two or three most widely circulated periodicals in the entire United States at this point. Where again, Cartwright argues that enslavement is the best conditions that people of African descent could find themselves in. Because when left to himself, Cartwright said, the Negro indulges in his, what Cartwright called, natural disposition to idleness and sloth does not take exercise enough to expand the lungs and to vitalize, whatever that means, his blood. The blood becomes so highly carbonized and deprived of oxygen that it not only becomes unfit to stimulate the brain to energy, but unfit to stimulate the nerves of sensation distributed to the body. That is cutting edge medical science in the 1850s in the United States, and it is being used in the service of human enslavement. There is nothing to prove that these universal judgments that Cartwright is making were accurate. And he had plenty of critics even then who are basically saying, all you're doing is dressing up a pro-slavery argument with medical terminology, carbonized blood. I mean, what the hell is that, right? But this is what Cartwright does. And in this, he reflects this broader impulse, again, to write these subjective, culturally constructed, and again, whites hold power in U.S. society, and they are the ones making the categories, right? That matters. And deploying the language of science and medicine in service of them. But it wasn't just scientific or what we might call pseudoscientific discourse. It was politics as well. So by the time of the Civil War, these five states pictured here with the black stars were the only states in the United States that allowed black people to have the right to vote. Now, many other states in the so-called free north, north of the Mason-Dixon line, had at one point allowed black people who owned a sufficient amount of property to vote. In fact, in the early 1800s, many state constitutions, their requirement to vote was that one was male, 21 years of age, and owned a certain amount of property. Property was what gave one the license to participate formally in politics by voting and or holding office. In the 1820s and moving into the 1830s, most states in the United States and then the new states that were coming in greatly expanded the franchise, the right of suffrage. It's what historians call an era of universal white manhood suffrage. And what these new state constitutions do is they take away that property requirement. One does no longer need to own a certain amount of property to vote in a state or federal ele or local or national election. And this is seen at the time as a great democratization of U.S. society. So it's important to point out, however, that there were some black people who had the right to vote who got it taken away in the supposed democratization of the suffrage because these new revisions in state constitutions as well as the constitutions of new states coming into the country placed a racial requirement on voting. To vote, one had to be male, 21, free and white. And free and white are the new words that enter these documents, the supreme law of the state in terms of who has the franchise and who can participate politically. And so again, by the time of the Civil War, there are only five states that make allowances for people of color to vote. 
And so this is what the Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court was referring to in the infamous Dred Scott decision of 1857, one of the milestones on the way to the U.S. Civil War. And what the Dred Scott case was about was about a formerly enslaved African-American man named Dred Scott, whose enslaver was a U.S. Army officer, a surgeon, as a matter of fact. And in the Army, then as now, you were transferred around to different posts. Scott had been purchased by this army surgeon in Missouri, a slave state, but had also accompanied his, his enslaver, his quote unquote owner, to billets in both Wisconsin and Illinois, states that did not sanction the institution of slavery and in fact had prohibited it in their state constitutions. So Scott sued uh, his master's family upon the death of his master, that he should be free by virtue of having resided in free states and territories, that the language of the Declaration of Independence was unequivocal on that subject. And what the U.S. Supreme Court said when the case worked all the way up to the Supreme Court in 1857, what the court said was, it doesn't matter what Dred Scott thinks because he is a black person and black people don't count. And that's what this lengthy quote is here, one of, the, one of the most infamous portions of probably the most infamous decision rendered by the U.S. Supreme Court. Taney is basically denying the right of Dred Scott to assert legal standing in the U.S. court system. And this argument that the principles of the American founding somehow gave Scott a case, Taney is at extra pains to try to repudiate. The language used in the Declaration of Independence, Taney said, show that neither the class of persons who had been imported as slaves nor their descendants, whether they had become free or not, were then acknowledged as part of the people, nor intended to be included in the general words used in that memorable incident, instrument, the Declaration. So in other words, the authors of the Declaration of Independence, when they said things like all men, and made this universalizing claim of freedom and civil rights that they really only met white people. Tawny continues that they had, that is black people, had for more than a century before been regarded as beings of an inferior order and altogether unfit to associate with the white race. And so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect and to be reduced to slavery for their benefit. And this is the phrase that has resonated from the Dred Scott decision. No rights which the white man was bound to respect. Now, Tawny ignores the existence of free black communities in the antebellum North. He gets his history a little bit wrong and he was kind of a jerk throughout the whole opinion. It's of dubious legality in a number of different ways. But what Tawny was doing was basically giving expression to the general political and cultural impulse of white America. Black people, and by extension, the Mexicans that had been recently brought into the United Western United States by conquest, or Native Americans who had lived in the areas claimed by the United States but had been pushed out or were in the process of being pushed out, they too had no rights to which the white man was bound to respect. And so again, we see this logic and how it works out in the United States. In 1865, after the Civil War, when slavery had been ended, supposedly, by the 13th Amendment, although terms and conditions apply, we tend to think sometimes that, you know, it was the ex-slave states, the ex-Confederacy, where all the racist stuff happened. And that in the North, where slavery didn't exist, that racial equality was maintained. But that is not true. So, for example, in 19 out of 24 states in the so-called free North, black people were not allowed the right to vote. They could not serve on juries or, or give legal testimony. And the five states that are marked by X's here, including our own state of Iowa, were states where black people were forbidden to reside on a permanent basis. In the territorial and then eventually state constitutions of each of these five areas, and in fact, Oregon basically copied theirs from ours in Iowa, Black people were forbidden to settle within the boundaries of the state. They could temporarily reside, and in some cases to do so, they had to pay a bond for good behavior. This was the case in Ohio and Indiana, for example. But race, and in particular racism, people's humanity being open to question, 
terms and conditions apply to the supposedly universal grants of life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, the supposedly unalienable rights that the Declaration of Independence promised. Those did not apply to people of color. And even slavery persists after the Civil War. It evolves, it mutates, it looks different. Uh, it takes the form of convict leasing, but unfreedom, the enslavement of human beings persists after the 13th Amendment. And this is why I think one of the, the most telling images, I like to show this in class when I talk about this with students, because we're so ingrained in thinking that, you know, 1865, the Civil War is over, the 13th Amendment is passed, slavery is ended. And yes, there were 4 million African-American men and women who did receive their freedom, not much else, but their freedom as a result of that. But there were tens of thousands of them who became re-enslaved in the years afterwards through the weaponization of the criminal justice system. So this is the sale of a human being at the courthouse door in the city of Annapolis, Maryland, Anne Arundel County Sheriff, 12 o'clock Monday, or 12 o'clock on the 8th of December, 1866 right? That's a year after the 13th Amendment. Now, I know Steven Spielberg made the movie Lincoln and everybody celebrated at the end when they got the 13th Amendment passed, but this is the historical reality. A Negro man named Richard Harris was going to be sold into enslavement. He had been convicted at the Anne Arundel County Circuit Court for larceny, but he could not pay his fine that went with his conviction, so he was sentenced by the court to be sold as a slave. Ex-Confederates made no bones about what it was they were trying to do. So yes, one constitutional regime that had sanctioned the institution of slavery had ended, but as many whites of the South put it, we're gonna bring it back, we're just gonna make it look differently. And so we see the first prison boom in US history in the decades after the US Civil War. And some of the most infamous names in penal history in the United States, Parchman Farm, Angola Prison, were facilities literally built on the exact same sites as plantations where some of the inmates in these prisons had been held as slaves before the Civil War. So slavery doesn't end, it adapts and it evolves. And as this was occurring, the, the seeds of Jim Crow in an era of violent lynching and racial segregation and white terrorism and forms of organizations like the Ku Klux Klan in the ex-Confederate states of the South, at the very same time, Westward expansion of white settlers from the east into the Trans-Mississippi West was underlaid by some of the very same principles. So this is a famous painting that represents the idea of manifest destiny painted by an artist named John Gast. Uh, and it's in pretty much every US history textbook that you will ever find. But note that the imagery here, the virginal white figure in the middle representing America, this is Columbia. And she is floating across the landscape from east to west, holding the school book in her arm around which is also looped telegraph wire, instant communication being strung out behind her along with the railroads coming in her wake. And so this was the march of civilization and notice who's fleeing in her, you know, ahead of her, you know, behind her all is light. Ahead of her, there is darkness and savagery, the buffalo, the Indian herds make way for civilization. So a very racialized view here of what the future of the United States was gonna look like. And this is what it looked like in practice. From 1776 until our present day, the lands that start out in blue were lands where various Native American tribes, societies, sociolinguistic groups and communities resided on for at least generations, if not longer. What's left in the reddish are areas where natives are confined to now. This is the process of reservation, of Indian removal, as it became known. And this too was justified using the same sort of racialized policy that was used to uphold the institution of slavery and its successors after the Civil War. The United States was to be primarily a white man's country. And it should be whites who enjoy the benefits of expansion into the fertile lands, uh, the mineral laden mines, the, the expansive prairies and pasture lands of the Trans Mississippi West. On the West Coast, we see this as well. 
with anti-Chinese sentiment that sparks to life in the 1850s. The first major wave of Asian immigration in the United States comes on the heels of the 1848 California gold rush. But by the couple of decades after the Civil War, there was profound anti-Chinese sentiment on the part of most whites living on the U.S. West Coast. The Chinese were seen as competition for wages and labor. They were seen as too culturally different to ever assimilate into U.S. culture. And more importantly, perhaps most menacingly, it did not appear that the Chinese wanted to assimilate into American culture. Uh, the profoundly visual and visible cultural differences were seen as a repudiation by many white Americans of the idea that these newcomers into our territories should assimilate. Economic competition. Uh, the, China, the Chinese person behind this hardworking American cobbler is wielding a sword that's labeled cheap labor, for example. So characters of Chinese like this, you know, these racist stereotypes. This is an editorial cartoon in one of the national periodicals in the United States, The Wasp, a humor and news magazine that was popular in the late 19th century. Even detergent advertisements, the magic washer, manufactured by the George D. Company of Dixon, Illinois, capitalized on anti-Chinese sentiment to sell its product. And so what you see, you might not be able to see it at the very bottom of the picture of Uncle Sam kicking out uh, the Chinese person. The Chinese must go, is what it says at the bottom of this advertisement. Don't use this if you want to be dirty, we see right behind Uncle Sam's head here. The implications and the racialization here are clear. And in fact, what we see is in 1883, on the heels of explosions of anti-Chinese sentiment represented by such cultural icons like this, the first federal legislation that, ex that excludes an entire group from the right to immigrate into the United States. And that was the Chinese Exclusion Act, which was renewed and expanded later in the 1880s and applied to other groups in immigration restriction legislation that we see in the 1920s as well. So this is a country for whites and for not for people of color. And so one of the most profound ways in which we see that shaped in more recent times in the 20th century comes from the phenomenon that we know as redlining, uh, which you might have heard of. Uh, there was a great exhibit on redlining in Des Moines uh, that was hosted uh, here in, in the city several months ago. Uh, redlining was a policy undertaken by the FHA, the Federal Housing Authority, during the Great Depression. Uh, the Federal Housing Authority was empowered to loan resources, assets, credits, et cetera, to banks to help keep home ownership afloat in what was the worst economic downturn that the United States had ever seen. So who got these federal funds? Who got mortgages to either purchase their own home or to save a home that was in danger of a mortgage going into default because of the Great Depression? Who had access to these things? So this is one of the F8, and there were city maps that were made to help guide local officials, FHA affiliated lenders with federal housing legislation and funding from Roosevelt's New Deal. This is Portland, Oregon's map. And so you'll note here that it's color coded. There's red, there's yellow, then there's blue, and then there's green. And so FHA agents had extensive explanation that came along with these maps. And so this is an excerpt from the federal housing authorities uh, that, uh, that accompanied some of these some of these urban maps from the later part of the 1930s. So the yellow areas, look at some of the language that's being used here, right? These are areas where we see the infiltration of a lower grade population. The red areas, detrimental influences, undesirable population or infiltration of it. This is language that one would use to describe your house getting infested with termites more so than the neighborhood and who is living within it. And these were the guidelines that basically determined access to what is seen as both then and now the American dream, home ownership, the acquisition of real estate, of property, of the American dream, right? Home ownership opens the door to more credit and to financial resources that are simply not available to those who do not have things like home ownership, a mortgage approval, maybe equity into their house. And so who had access to this? Yellow and red areas did not, as a general rule. 
The FHA did not make loans or tried to avoid it at all costs in these areas. So again, you don't want to make loans and promote home ownership or access to credit in areas of a lower grade population of detrimental influences, the undesired that come from the undesirable population. So here's Des Moines. Now, our urban geography has changed a little bit since the 1930s, in particular, uh, I-235. Uh, we see the removal of much of the community that's in Area D2 here, uh, primarily Black-owned neighborhoods and businesses to make way for I-235. The East Village development uh, is also coming out of some of this area. But back in the 1930s, your red areas were where almost all of the city's African-American population resided. So who gets access and who doesn't? Who gets tools and who doesn't? That matters. Judgments made by impersonal bureaucratic organizations but rooted in racism have shaped our present today. When we talk about the racial wealth gap, that is where it comes from. The median white family has over 110,000 dollars in assets that it could pass down to the next generation. That is a huge gap when you look at the median black family or Latino family. And in fact, when the federal government studied the racial wealth gap in 2016, the commission and the different researchers affiliated with the study concluded that if things stay the way they are in terms of racial disparities from access to credit, for example, the legacy of redlining, the prevention of the accumulation of real estate by communities of color because of redlining policies and such. If all of these trends remain in place and we don't do anything about it, it would take 228 years for the racial wealth gap to narrow in the United States. So racism isn't just the obvious form that we might see, you know, in our sort of stereotypical view, someone wearing the white sheets of the Ku Klux Klan someone using the N-word in public. Yes, that's racism, but what racism is is a damaging, corrosive infrastructure. It is the water in which we swim in American society. It is the explanation for things like racial disparities and the wealth gap, for example. Who gets to be an American and who doesn't? Who has access and who doesn't? Who gets the benefit of the doubt, the opportunity, and who doesn't? And these are structures of inequity that have accumulated layer by layer, generation after generation, from the founding of this country and even beforehand until our present moment today, where its effects are, of course, patently obvious. So what do we do? What do we do when we're faced with such an overwhelming set of inequities, a huge structure of racism, of what's been wrought by white supremacist ideals, legal inequities, moral wrongs, the legacy of enslavement, the legacy of removal and genocide of indigenous Americans, of anti-Asian exclusionary legislation. What do we do? What do we do to try to improve our society when we're faced with all of this? So you've probably heard the quote from Frederick Douglass, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Uh, it's a famous line. Um, it's certainly true. Uh, but what, in, what I like is the rest of the quote that we don't often get because it challenges us a little more, particularly if you identify as white, like I do. This quote pushes us. It might make us defensive, but that's the point. There is no progress if there is no struggle, Douglas says. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. Think about some of what we've heard last summer. Sure, I agree with Black Lives Matter, but I don't like the tactics they're using. They're too confrontational. Why are they stopping traffic? These protests are getting violent, regardless of who instigates that violence, right? If there is no struggle, there is no progress. The struggle may be a moral one, and it may be a, both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. And for Douglas, who had been born into slavery, and then, as he put it, stole himself into freedom, I think he knew what he was talking about there. 
So change begins when we begin to see things differently, when we are liberated cognitively and emotionally from what we used to think was common sense. Yeah, well, those neighborhoods are poor because, well, those people don't know how to respect property. Where are the fathers in their family? That's their culture. Where's their work ethic? Pull yourself up by your bootstraps, right? All of those things, the water in which we are swimming. We need to, A, realize we're in the water, and then, B, probably get out of that pool. Change begins when we see things differently and are liberated from our often wrong notions of common sense. That is the way things are. Because what American history shows us is that structures of inequality will always reproduce themselves unless we intervene to stop that reproduction. So from the enslavement of human beings to convict labor to the war on drugs and mass incarceration today, slavery has been with us, right? It evolves. That is the process. Structures of inequality do this by default unless someone intervenes to stop that process of reproduction. And so the challenge before all of us, particularly at this moment in which we live, is how are you going to intervene? How do we intervene to stop that process of reproduction that has bedeviled us for generations? If there is no struggle, there is no progress. If there is no intervention, there is no justice. So thanks for coming out and spending some time. Uh, if there's time for Q&A or conversation, uh, I'd love to have a little bit of that depending where we are. My clock stopped. And so as far as I know, it is 635, but I think that that's probably inaccurate. <laughs> that's right. You still have another 55 minutes to go. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> no, but we do have a couple questions. One showed up in the Q&A. I think there's one in the chat as well. So we'll start with the one that went to the Q&A. Sure. I'm going to stop the screen share so I can actually see people talking to me. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right, so first question, what is the source for information about the state's allowances of black residency? I'm referring to the slide you had shortly after the Dred Scott slide, the slide with the states showing that Iowa was one of, that didn't allow permanent residency by African Americans. Uh, so there's a couple good books on it. I'm gonna put one of them in the chat, um, make sure that I get it to all panelists and attendees. It's an older book, but it's still really good talks about Iowa, but other Western territories as well. It's called The Frontier Against Slavery by Eugene Burwanger. But what he also talks about was just because these states and, and their white leaders were against slavery did not mean that they were egalitarian when it came to the issue of race. And you could look in the minutes of the Iowa Territorial Constitutional Convention as well down at the state archives. I think they're on microfilm and they might be digitized, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Uh, where they go over that provision as well. Okay, another question. Have you seen any change over time in the attitudes or reactions of your students when you discuss the history of race in American class? Are students today less likely to challenge notions like white privilege than they were in the past? That's a great question. Um, I'm hesitant to overgeneralize, but I think what I can say is there is, I think, a remarkable and, and I think brave willingness on the part of my students that I've seen really since I've come to Grandview, but certainly within the last decade, to really wrestle and grapple with these issues in class. And as a U.S. historian who teaches primarily the 19th century, for example, you know, slavery was a thing in U.S. history. Racism is a thing. We got to talk about this, right? And what I see from my students is a sort of eagerness to dive into things and to really wrestle with issues that they may not have had the opportunity to wrestle with in earlier history courses or earlier educational experiences. And I think one of the disservices that we do in education is sometimes we, we look at students and say, well, they're not really ready to handle this tough of a discussion yet. So we kind of take some of the sharper edges off our, you know, how we teach and present history. Uh, I think that is changing on the high school level, and I'm seeing that in college as well. But what I'm really impressed by is almost all of my students have a willingness even you know, to admit that what they don't know and to engage in dialogue with their classmates in order to become better educated. Now, that doesn't mean the conversations are easy. 
Uh, I know sometimes one of the hardest parts for those of us who are white is we have to unlearn some of the things that we learned, even though we didn't realize we were learning them at the time, right? So the things that we thought were conventional wisdom from lack of experience or things of that nature, those are the things that have to be, the knots that have to be untied. And sometimes that can make us defensive, um, but it is really important for those of us who are white to do that work with ourselves and with other white people, right, in those spaces. So that's where I think education can create a real model example, the way that classes and students engage with these sorts of things. Uh, and, and from what I see from my students here, it makes me hopeful towards the future. Um, again, you know, not the sense that they know everything, but a, 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 a willingness to acknowledge where their knowledge is limited, where their experiences are limited, and where they might do better, and then getting in and wrestling with some of these really difficult issues. Okay, here's another question. Are there still effects today of redlining? And I guess the question probably maybe that they're going for is, is this process still going on? Is this still legal? It is not legal per se, uh, but the legacy of redlining is powerful and carries on almost as effectively in sort of what we might call informal ways. So for example, if you look at the 2008 economic crisis that was that was prompted at first by the, the sort of implosion of the mortgage market, if you look at who was getting those really risky subprime mortgages, it was almost all borrowers of color, an overwhelming percentage. Uh, we have studies that show us that all other things being equal, a black sounding name on a, on a mortgage application will get a higher interest rate on the quote than a non black sounding name. Like all of these sorts of bias experiments that go into the way that credit is extended in financial institutions. Uh, so redlining, you know, the legacy is absolutely still with us. You can pull up redlining maps. Uh, and in fact, if you Google redlining maps, uh, you'll get to a, uh, you'll find a project run out of the University of Richmond. I think it's called Mapping Inequality. I'm not 100% sure on that, but they have digitized all the redlining maps that they can find for American urban areas. That's where I got the ones that I put in the slides. Uh, so yeah, Mapping Inequality is what it's called. I'll put it in the chat as well. Um, and what these, what, what redlining does, again, it's generational, right? Like once you have a house, if you've been approved for a mortgage, that gives you a bump in your credit rating, right? You're credit worthy. You can have access to the sorts of things that are necessary to move up the socioeconomic ladder. If you don't have access to that and you continue to rent, like how do you accumulate wealth? How do you accumulate assets if you rent as opposed to own? Right. And so you get trapped in these cycles of high interest, short term loans and you're you're sort of on a treadmill. You're never able to save or accumulate because you're always paying off. You know what happens when you don't have access to decent credit. And so when we talk about things like community microfinancing, uh, and some of that, some of those uh, initiatives are underway in Des Moines, for example. Those are the sorts of things that we're trying to do is take some of the sharpest edges off the legacy of redlining. And if you look at these redlining uh, maps and then look at the demographics, you know, the majority, you know, population in each of these neighborhoods by race, they almost completely map even today with African American neighborhoods and, and uh, communities of color as opposed to white neighborhoods. And if you look at the Des Moines one, um, you can certainly see how that architecture has been embedded in our city ever since. Okay, we have time maybe for one or two more. Um... One person asks, could you please touch on the war on drugs and the results for the black community? Yeah, the war on drugs as we see it evolve in the 1970s and then move through the Reagan and Clinton administrations and culminating in the 1994 crime bill, its effect on communities of color, in particular the African-American community has been cataclysmic. Uh, there's no two ways about it. Uh, there are profound injustices and racial disparities in mass incarceration today. Iowa, for example, we are one of the, the bottom five states in terms of how bad our racial imbalances are. African Americans represent under 4% of our state's population, but over 40% of our state's jail and prison population. When we look at low level drug offenses, who's getting alternate treatments like drug court? and who's getting sent to jail and has a criminal record as a result of things like marijuana possession, for example. Racism has, has determined, has dictated this. Uh, and we have a nation today, we lock up more people than anywhere else in any other country in the world and second place isn't even close. And if you're a black male in the United States, one in three black men will be incarcerated at some point in their life. 
And to me, that's an unacceptable statistic, right? So we have weaponized the, the war on drugs has been the latest weapon to use in terms of this policing and criminalization of blackness. Uh, when you look at the ways, you know, cash bail is another way that it functions inequitably. Uh, so the war on drugs, and it's also led to the militarization of the police that we see today, right? You know, why do SWAT teams have a tank? Uh, a lot of the funding that comes from that comes from the Reagan administration's war on drugs when they're trying to empower local police departments to go after crack dealers. And so you have a bunch of crack dealers that are getting arrested by an armored unit of SWAT teams, and you have white businessmen doing cocaine that have no legal consequences whatsoever. And so you see how that sort of, that has put a huge um, uh, cleft in our society, right? There is a canyon when it comes to racial disparities. And to me, that's one of the most, uh, one of the most urgent issues that we face as a society today is how are we going to fix policing and incarceration because it is so clearly broken along the lines of racial injustice. Okay, and we'll have one more to wrap it up. This is a more general one and maybe hopefully a positive one to end on. Um, how do we take this history to our coworkers and businesses to help change the culture there? Oh, if I had the answer to that, you know, we, <laughs> we hope you had some wisdom for us, Kevin. <laughs> yeah, so, but you know, that's a really crucial question because it does come down to what do it we is. do, right? Like even big historical movements, you know, those are the sum totals of individual actions. So we do have power to affect change. And so I'll say two thoughts occur to me. One is all of us need to look at, you know, what is our bubble? right? What media do we consume? What authors do we read? What do we watch on TV? Who do we talk to? Who's in the rooms at work? Is it all people who look like us or, or is it a more diverse group? If it's a homogenous group, why is that? And what can you do about it, right? And so some easy steps, if you're white in particular, expand your media consumption. Start reading different voices, listening to different voices, hearing people's stories that come from different places and that look different than you. When we see people as, as you know, full and complicated human beings as opposed to just an abstract category, then anti-racist work becomes so much easier. And the second thought that comes to me, again, aimed primarily at those of us who are white, what are we doing in the whites only spaces? If you're white in this country, it is easy to go through your day almost by default and be surrounded by people who look like you. And so when you are in this, in a whites only space and someone says that thing or that joke, do you call it out? Do you stop? Do you say, hey, wait a minute, let's, we need to unpack that a little bit, or do you let it go? One of the chief obstacles to racial justice has been white discomfort in this country. And so white people, a lot of the work is on us. We have to be willing to get uncomfortable, to have the hard conversations, and more importantly, to do the really hard self-work and to hold each other accountable to the type of society that we want to have. So those are two thoughts that come into mind with those questions. Well, I'll answer the last question, which is, will this recording be available? Kevin has graciously allowed us to put this up for one month, this month after this date. So be looking for that if you want to rewatch it or you want to uh, give it to friends, link it for friends to watch or whatever you have. It's a good idea to spread the word. It will be available from our website. I want to thank you, Kevin, for being with us tonight again. And looking forward again to having you grace our stage at some point in the future. Well, thanks for letting me share the space with you all tonight. And thanks to everybody who attended for coming and uh, participating in this work this evening. Thank you.